church say amen again very thankful to be here with you all this evening i'm grateful that we are moving to our next phase of our study in preparation to meet our god the lord has been teaching us night after night and on sabbath day about practical steps and practical ways and real experiences that are absolutely necessary so that we can know how to stand with god when a lot of individuals will not be standing you see the reality is like in the days of Nebuchadnezzar when he set up an image to that power and it was a golden image and he said when the music would play that everyone must bow down or fall to the ground and the Bible is very clear that when the music played when the image was erected the great majority even of those who claim to know love and worship God the great majority unfortunately they bowed they fell down to the ground but there was a few that remained standing that was a picture of what things will be like in these last moments in earth's history this is why as as sensible people as people who are connected to Christ we can't allow our minds to be distracted by numbers and by what does the majority think and you know things of this nature we have only one concern what is thus saith the Lord this is our concern family does God approve of what we are talking about does God approve of the things in which we believe and are holding near and dear to our hearts and so day after day or night after night we have been studying the Word of God so that we can make sure that we will be counted amongst those who are indeed a people prepared to meet their God and family I'm just telling you right now we're getting ready to spend eternity with God and Jesus knows that our our love connection with sin must be broken you see did you know that hell fire is a punishment but it's also an act of God's mercy did you know that probably didn't know that I don't know if you knew that hell fire being eternally lost in one respect is punishment for sure but in another respect it's a demonstration of God's mercy so let me give you an example what happens if we love sin what happens if we just love sin there are things that the Bible calls wrong but we love it there's things the Bible calls sin but we just enjoy it what if those things still reside in our heart you know why being lost could be a demonstration of God's mercy because wouldn't it be torturous to go throughout eternity doing something you hate think about that wouldn't it be torturous to go throughout eternity doing something that you hate that's why for some people it'll be looked upon or really for all people who are lost it'll be an act of God's mercy because God knows that if you love sin in heaven there's no sin and God doesn't want to put you somewhere for eternity if we love sin and hate righteousness why would God punish us by putting us in an environment of righteousness for eternity we would hate being there you know there's young people that feel that way right now there's some young people that saying, look I want to leave my home why because they always making me have worship they're always making us sing these songs I can't watch my R-rated or PG-13 movies with all the cursing and the murder and all the other stuff I can't play my video games where there's naked women and men and women killing each other and running over each other with their cars or whatever I can't do all of that so you know what the young people do they say when I'm 18 I'm leaving this stuff but if you go to those same young people and say do you want to go to heaven you know what they all say oh yes and I'm thinking you poor deceived soul what do you think is going to be in heaven worship which you evidently hate that's why you left your mom and dad's house nothing but music that is glorifying to God there'll be no cursing there'll be no swearing there'll be no derogatory terms towards men or women there'll be none of that 
The only music in heaven is going to be that which is indicative of holiness. You sure you want to go to heaven? I'm telling you the truth. I believe we are living in a generation where people don't think anymore. Thinking is becoming an art. It's like we got to understand, think through your decisions, beloved. I'm serious. Go to the average young person who rebelled against their mothers and fathers. I'm not talking about fanatics. I'm not talking about toxic homes. Some young people need to leave houses like that. But I'm talking about a home where there's a father and there's a mother that loves Jesus, they love worship, they love the things of God, and they just conduct their homes in a way where they want to just make it a little heaven on earth. I'm talking about those homes. When young people leave those homes, go to them, ask them, do you want to go to heaven? Do you believe in God and do you want to go to heaven? Almost 100% of those young people are going to say, yes, of course. But it's like, but you left your mom and dad's house because there was too much worship. There were too many rules. Do you think heaven's not going to have worship? Do you think heaven's not going to have rules? This is why I'm telling you, Jesus says, you know what you need? You need the seed. You need the seed to come into your heart so that you could be born again and Christ can take away the stony heart and give you a heart that actually begins to love worship, to love righteousness, to love holiness. And that's why we have transitioned from the realities of prophecy. We see what's coming in the world. We see what's happening in the church. And it's a very dark picture. But the reality is, is God sent a message that if the message is received in the heart, we can actually develop a love walk with Jesus. We could actually begin to love him. We begin to say, I actually want the things you want. And that's why yesterday's studies were so important, both the morning and last night. It was so important because we were talking about how to have communion with God. Communion. You know the biggest reason why people should want to go to heaven? Because they're finally going to be with the one that they love more than their lives forever. Is that how you feel about Jesus? That's what God wants for all of us. He wants us to, to see that he is worthy of our love. He is worthy of our devotion. I've realized love is very powerful. Love is very powerful. It'll make you endure things that in any other case you would not endure. There's a story of the days of the Christian church and they were being punished by Nero and they would you know, be thrown into the lion's den and made sport in the Colosseums and all these things. And there's a story of a father and a son. And they love each other and they love Christ very dearly. And the story says that as a soldier was walking towards one of these two to put them in the arena with the lions, it says that they saw the father and the son doing something that blew their minds. You know what the father and son were doing? It looks like they were fighting. They were wrestling with each other. The father and the son, they're about to be thrown in an arena where lions are going to pierce their flesh and literally tear them apart until they bleed out and die. And what is this father and son doing? They're not praying together. The soldier sees them wrestling. So the soldier is curious as to what's going on. The soldier starts getting closer. What's going on here? And you know what the soldier heard as he got closer? He heard the father saying, I'll go first. And then he heard the son saying, no, dad, I'll go first. They were wrestling with each other over who will go first to honor God and spill their blood that they may honor him. What a strange story. What a strange story. People who love God more than their own lives. There's a story, you know, um, 
I, I would imagine some of us have, have, have you ever heard of the Waldensians? You ever heard of the Waldensians, right? Huguenots and these wonderful people who were in the Alps and they were trusting God with their lives. They were on fire for the Lord. They honored God and his holy law. And there's a story of a Waldensian girl. You know, the Waldensians would have to, you know, the, the Waldensians would have to, you know, be sneaky because they were living in the Dark Ages, okay? They were living in papal supremacy. So the, the, they would have to do things in a sneaky way. They would, they would take a Bible page and tear it up, tear it out of the Bible, roll it up, bake bread, and then they would stick a scripture in the center of a loaf of bread. So when they would come in town and all the papist soldiers would say, what are you doing? They would say, we're here to sell bread. And they weren't lying because they were selling physical bread, but they was also selling the bread of life. And here it is that as they were going on, they would sell bread and people would get the loaves of bread. And when they eventually would break it open, they would say, oh, what's this? And they would read specific scriptures that would enlighten their minds to the realities of what's going on around them and how to make Jesus their personal friend. Well, a young lady got caught. She was 13 years old. I used to have my children read these books when they were younger. This young Waldensian girl got caught. And you know what they did to her? They said to her, they said, we will not kill you if you tell us where your villagers are. Where, where's your family? And the girl said, I will not. They said, if you do not tell us where your family is, we will torture you. And she responded and said, I will not. They took her and they began to beat her, 13 years old. After she was beaten, they said, will you tell us now? She said, I will not. They took her fingers and one by one removed physically the nail from off of each of her fingers, one at a time. Very painful process. She's screaming and she's hurting. And when she's there crying and she's in pain, they said, will you tell us where your family is now? And she said, I will not. They took her to a precipice where there was several hundred feet of a drop to one's death. They took her, they held her up, and held her over the precipice. And they said, will you tell us where your family is? And she paused. You know why she paused? She was giving her final prayer to God. After she finished, she looked up at the papists and said, I will not. And they dropped her to her death. Now here's the thing. You think Jesus is going to let people go through all of that and somehow let us and our rebellion and still skate into heaven anyhow when these people paid such a price to remain faithful unto death? No, brothers and sisters. God, God would be unjust if he did that. The Bible is very clear. Be faithful unto death, and then you will receive your crown of life. Revelation 2 and verse 10. And what I'm convinced of is that father and that son, that young Waldensian girl, and the many millions over the ages that were willing to die for their God and for their Savior. They had a relationship with God. Religion was something very serious with them. It wasn't just the thing that we do. Yeah, I'm just a Seventh-day Advent, I'm just part of this group. No, 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 these people were serious. These people were very serious about what they believed. They were very serious about the God that they served. And so yesterday, we talked about such an important point in our study about how to build the relationship with God. And everything hinges on communion. If you're not having deep, heartfelt, 
genuine, substantive communion with God where you're learning more about Him and love is being developed. I don't think we'll be able to stand like the Waldensian girl, like the father and son, and like many of the other faithful. And so I hope this morning you got your morning manna. I hope last night you set your time. I hope you guarded it jealously today. And I hope that you got your time with the Lord. Now we stopped at lesson number four, but tonight I have lesson number five. And as we prepare our hearts to receive the word, I'm going to once again have a word of prayer. And I would like to invite you to kneel with me as we pray together. And if you can't kneel, that's all right. You bow your heads where you are. But if you can kneel, let's kneel together and let's pray and let's ask God to do something ever so special for us that our hearts may be closely drawn to him. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings that you've given to us, especially for allowing us to make it throughout this day. We went out, we did our business, and we were privileged to come back to the house of prayer where there is healing. We are very grateful for your amazing grace and love that has been with us, Lord, and we ask you to please pour out your spirit upon us and help us, Lord, that in all that we say and that we do, that your name may be honored and glorified. But Lord, teach us, we pray. Show us how to have a walk with you that is so strong that it was like the walk that Enoch had with you in days of old. And I pray that a relationship between you and us will be so strongly developed that like that Waldensian girl, like that father and that son, and so many others who were faithful even unto death, Lord, please, let it be our testimony as well. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You see, last night, we, yesterday, uh, you'll remember that we talked about in order for communion to be successful, there needs to be giving and receiving. You remember we studied that yesterday? It has to be giving and receiving. Now, when we talk about giving and receiving, so here it is, we're going to God and we're giving ourselves to him. We're giving our voice, oh Lord, here I am. And we are pouring our hearts out to God in genuine, sweet communion. But that in and of itself does not make communion. We have to also receive from him. We have to hear from him. Communion is you talking to God, but we need to hear God talk back to us. So lesson number five is we must learn to listen. We need to learn to listen. In every communion connection with the Lord, it is not enough for us to just talk to God, but we want God to talk to us. And sometimes, have you noticed, tell me if any of your prayer time has ever been like this. Oh Lord, thank you for this day. Father, such and such and such and such, you say a whole lot of things that you need or want, and then you say, please, Lord, bless me with these, we ask, in Jesus' name, amen, and then you immediately get up and go about your next duty for the day. How many people have had that kind of experience? Yeah, that's probably every single one of us in this room. Now, the reality is, is that we probably are missing out on some of the greatest blessings, because I think what's more exciting than me talking to God is God talking to me. I think a lot of people would love to have God talk to them and say all the things and answer all the questions that's so deep and so heavy upon their heart. Well, the Bible has a promise in Isaiah 50 in verse 4. The Bible says, The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Now watch. He, that's talking about God, he wakeneth me morning by morning. He wakens mine ear to hear as the learned. So that means that getting up early in the morning and getting time with God is ever so important. Because what did the Bible just show? God loves to talk to us, especially in the morning. 
God loves to talk to us, especially in the morning. Go to the book of Proverbs chapter 8. If you look at Proverbs, the 8th chapter, notice what the Bible says. Proverbs, we're looking at chapter 8. And I want you to see how the Bible articulates this because this is for you. This is for me. This is the great blessing that the Lord wants to give each and every one of us. And I'm so thankful that he does it. The Bible says in Proverbs 8, and we're considering verse 17. I don't know what it is about God, but he loves doing things early. And the Bible says it. In Proverbs 8 and verse 13, if you're there, let me know by saying amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 8 and verse 17, it says, I love them that love me. And those that seek me when? Early shall find me. Did you see that? There goes God again. Those who seek me early. Now, there's two ways to look at the word early. The first way to look at the word early is age. It is better to seek God early in life than later. We're thankful for people who seek God later in life, but it's better to seek God early in life. That's why in the book of Ecclesiastes, God will often talk about children. Remember, you know, remember your creator in the days of your youth. You understand that? God wants you to remember him early. Why? Because less drama. It's less drama. If we learn about God and come to God and turn our lives over to him in our 30s and our 40s, man, we probably got some nasty scars that the world put on us, don't we? We got some nasty scars. I always tell people, my, I might look clean in my suit, but I'm telling you, under this suit are some scars that this world can put on you for living that worldly life. So it's a blessing, again, to my young brothers and sisters. You're so blessed. I'm telling you, if you got a father that loves to pray and worship and teach you the words of God, if you have a mother that loves to pray and worship and teaches you the word of God, you have no idea how blessed you are. I'm just telling you as a, as a, as a brother, I'm telling you as one who has worked with hundreds if th not thousands of young people over the many years I've been in this church, and I'm telling you, you're blessed if you have a mom and if you have a dad that believes in worship, that believes in Bible study, that believes in going to church and praying. You have no idea how blessed you are. I remember a gang wanted to go ahead and kill me. There was something that happened at my high school, and I got the blame for it. Didn't do it, but I got the blame for it. And I remember coming home and my mother opened the door with the phone in her hand and tears in her eyes. And she said, Dwayne, why do I have this gang? They were called the Decepticons, one of those characters from the movie Transformers that many people are familiar with. They were called the Decepticons. They were known for killing people with sledgehammers. Very brutal gang. They called my house and they told my mother and my father, we're gonna kill your son. So one morning, the next morning, they called my house. And they told my parents, we're gonna come by your house, we're gonna take our automatics, not semi-automatics, automatics. They said, we're gonna take our automatics and we're just gonna just, they called it spraying. They said, we're gonna spray your house with bullets. And I remember my father came to me and my father was a former gangster. You remember our dear brother when he was telling the children's story. My father was a former gangster. And oh my word, my dad came to me and he said, Dwayne, he said, look, the next time those guys call, he didn't say, let's pray together, son. He didn't say, son, let's look at what God promises of his protection. He didn't say anything of that nature. My father said to me, he said, the next time those guys call and they go around talking about they're going to come to the house and kill you, he said, here's what I want you to tell them. And I'm listening, like, like all right, dad, give me something. And my father says, when they say they're going to come by the house, dad says, tell them, come on. I'm listening like, are you crazy? I mean, I know you're my dad, but that's kind of crazy. But he continues, he says, tell them, come on by. And then he said, and tell them this, just remember, you are not bulletproof. He said, hang up the phone. And then my father reached in the back and he pulled out a gun and he left it with me to say, use it if you have to. I'm a teenager staring at the gun that I've never shot in my life. 
And what I'm saying is when I think about that, I think about how blessed a young man is when instead of their dad leaving a gun for them to possibly kill somebody before they kill you, he prays with you. He gives you the words of God and he gives you blessed assurance. I'm just telling you, young people, if you got a dad like that, you're blessed. You're very, very blessed. God wants us to understand that he wants to build relationship. He knows that it's not enough that you talk to him. He says, I want you to wake up early in life and early in the morning. That's the second application. Those who seek me early shall find me. What? Early in life and early when? In the morning. Why? Because he wakens our ear to hear him. There's special messages that God wants to hear. Now, here's the thing. How does God speak to us? How does God speak to us? You know, you, know, you, know the, you know what this is called, right? We call this the scriptures. But there's another term that Jesus uses for the scriptures. It's found in John 17. Let's turn there. If you go to John, the 17th chapter, there's another word for the scriptures. And I want you to see what it says. And I just want you to think with me a little bit, okay? Another term that God has for the scriptures is in John 17. And I want you to go to John 17, and I want you to look at verse 17. And the Bible says in John 17 and verse 17, Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Then he says, thy word is truth. So another thing that we call the scriptures is we call it the word of God. Is that right? Now, do you know how we speak? We use words. Is that right? That's how we speak. The only reason you understand what I'm saying is because I'm taking a collection of words and then I'm sharing it with you. Is that right? It's the same thing with God. How does God speak to us? The answer is simple, through his word. That's why we're told in inspiration, the scriptures are to be received as God's word to us, not written merely, but what else? Spoken. You see, if all you do is get up in the morning and pray, you, that's like having a one-sided relationship. Imagine a boyfriend who always talks to his girlfriend, but the girlfriend never talks to the boyfriend. You think a relationship like that's going to last? Imagine a husband who always talks to his wife, but the wife never talks to the husband. You think a relationship like that's going to be good? Of course not. So it is. Why is it that we get up every morning and we talk to God, but we don't take time to let him talk back to us? You're rushing, family. This is why for many of us, churches become ritualistic. It's the thing that we do. We have to be part of something because we just can't imagine not being religious, but we don't have relationship. And there's no way you can have relationship unless you talk to each other. I guarantee you, you want to see a marriage dissolve? Let there be a husband and wife that don't talk to each other. That is divorce in the making or hell on earth instead of heaven on earth. There's some people who say, well, we're in the church, we can't divorce, that'll make us look bad. So to save face, we'll just act divorced, but we won't actually get divorced. That's just crazy. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to have heaven on earth. He wants the husband to actually love his wife, and he wants the wife to actually love her husband and to actually enjoy each other's company. Can you imagine that? God says we can't have a relationship with him if we're just talking all the time. We never let him talk to us. But that's exactly what we're doing if you have even the strongest prayer life, but you have no study life. If you don't let God talk to you. Now, I want you to imagine this. This is going to sound weird, but just work with me. Just work with me. I want you to imagine you're married, right? Husband and wife. Let's start with the wives. The wife says, honey, how are you doing today? The husband looks at you and says nothing. But then the husband goes to somebody else and says, tell her I'm doing fine. And then somebody else comes along and says, oh, your husband's doing just fine. 
And then you say, honey, would you like to come home for dinner tonight? Or are you going to work late? The husband doesn't answer you. But instead, the husband goes to somebody else and tells them, I'm so sorry, dear, but I have to work a little late tonight. But I really love you and appreciate it. So the other person comes along and says, your husband wants me to tell you that he's not going to make it home for dinner tonight, but he really loves you and he appreciates it. Question, ladies, are you going to have a good relationship with your husband if that's the way you communicate? No. Brothers, here it is that you go to your wife and you say, honey, I want to know, can we spend some time together this evening? I miss being with you. The wife doesn't answer you, but the wife tells somebody else, tell him I'm a little tired this evening, maybe we'll try another time, but thanks for even thinking about me. And so the other person comes along to you and says, listen, she's a little tired right now, but she really appreciates you thinking about her. Maybe tomorrow night you guys can have, hang out together and have a, a great time. Brothers, would you be happy in a relationship like that? Okay. It's interesting. How many of us are trying to have a relationship with God, but we spend more time listening to ministers on YouTube, Audioverse, or whatever the network is, you listen to more sermons of what some person has to say God said to you, rather than you letting God talk to you directly. Did you get the point, fam? Did you get the point? A lot of us are living with God on a third-person relationship. And God is like, look, I like Dwayne, but I don't want him to be the guy that always has to tell you what I think about you. God is like, I have thoughts about you that I want to tell you myself. But I need you to cut Dwayne off, to cut Stephen Bohr off, to cut Doug Batchelor off, to cut all the famous preachers, teachers, and whoever you like, cut them all off and open up your Bible, get on your knees, and let's talk. There's a lot of people that are not doing that. They're having third-person relationship with God. And you're wondering why your relationship with God is not dynamic. You're wondering why it's not so real. Why? Because you're listening to what somebody else has to tell you about what God thinks about you. One of the best things that ever happened in my life is I stopped listening to sermons. I hardly listen to sermons. Hardly. Not that I'm against it, obviously. But I found something better. I got a direct line to God. And so now that I got a direct line to God, I've realized everything else is inferior. Even if you're a good preacher, you're a good preacher, but you're inferior in comparison to me talking directly to God. And I want to recommend to every single one of you, stop trying to build a relationship with Christ by listening to a bunch of preachers that are telling you what God thinks about you. That's not relationship. If you understand what I'm saying thus far, let me hear you say amen. All right, now watch this. We're told so with all the promises of God's words. In them, he is speaking to us individually. Listen to this. In the scriptures, God is speaking to us individually, speaking as directly as if we could listen to his voice. It is in these promises that Christ communicates to us his grace and power. They are leaves from that tree, which is for the healing of the nations. Received, assimilated, they are to be the strength of the character, the inspiration and sustenance of the life. Nothing else can have such healing power. Nothing besides can impart courage and faith, which give vital energy to the whole being. Study the word. It's the plan of Satan to keep you away from the word. It's the plan of Satan to keep you on YouTube, to keep you on Hope Channel and 3ABN and all the rest. Keep you there, but don't get in the word. Now, am I saying stay away from Hope Channel and 3ABN? God forbid. What I'm saying is let them be dessert. Let 3ABN be dessert. Let Hope Channel be dessert. Let all the networks, YouTube and the rest, let it be dessert. But your main on course is you, and God and time 
that you can spend time in hearing what he has to say to you personally, individually. This is how the Lord talks to us. Now, let's break this down a little bit because, uh, you know, I, I want us to really get into this thing. In the Bible, there's a lot of times that it, it introduces this idea that what happened in Scripture, what happened in biblical times, was actually for us. So I'm going to give you an example. In 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul talks about a lot of stuff that happened during the days of Israel as they left Egypt making their way to Canaan land. So what ended up happening is the Apostle Paul goes through all the things that happened with the children of Israel, but then he says this in verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them. That's the Israelites. All these things happen unto them for and samples. Now this word right here, this word uh, and samples right here, that word in the Greek, it, it, it's, a, it's a Greek word called tupos. It means types. It means types. And every time you have a type, you have an anti-type. So an example is, is when you walk out in sunlight, when the sun shines on you, it puts a type on the ground. What do we call it? Shadow. That shadow is a reflection of a reality. That's how typology works. Typology, a type is a shadow or a symbol. An anti-type is the reality of what that shadow or symbol was reflecting. That's typology. Now, here Paul says all these things that happened to the children of Israel as they left Egypt on their way to Canaan land was a symbol of what? Take a look. It says they were a symbol and they are written for, Paul says, our admonition. Paul's now talking about the believers. He's saying our, that's the believers. But wait, it's not just believers, but it's believers at a particular time. Look at the rest of the verse. It says it's written for our admonition upon whom the what? Ends of the world are come. Are we living in the time of the end? Yes. So you know what that means? That means that uh, those experiences that the children of Israel had when they left Egypt on their way to Canaan land was a symbol of what God's people living in the time of the end are going to have similar experiences. You know what that means? That means that every time you read the Old Testament, you're not reading past truth, you're reading present truth. Are you following that? You're not reading past truth. You're reading present truth. There's so much that happened in the Old Testament that's happening right now. It's just 2023 style. That's all. But it's the same stuff. Truly it was that Solomon said, go to Ecclesiastes 1. Take a look at what it says in Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 9. You have Psalms, you have Proverbs, and then you have Ecclesiastes. If you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, look at what Solomon said. It is so true. So true. In Ecclesiastes, we're looking at chapter 1, considering verse 9. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. What is that telling us? History repeats itself. History repeats itself. You look at the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, look at 2023. You follow that? History is just repeating itself. It's just a 2023 version of it. But it's the same stuff that happened in Genesis 19. And so this is the point that God was trying to teach us, is when you're studying the Bible, you're actually reading not just past truth, but you're reading present truth. How about this verse? Romans 15 and verse 4. The Bible says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Did you get that? What was written before was written for what? Our learning. Okay? It says that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. That's why all these problems that we face in life, God says, go back to what was written aforetime. There's solutions in here. What do we talk to God about, right? 
I, I wish, I wish, I, I wish that in our morning communion with God, we were just spending just minutes, if not hours, in praise and thanksgiving. But that's not how a lot of us are spending time with God. You know what we're doing with God? Lord, I'm sick and I need healing. Lord, I'm broke and I need money. Lord, my loved ones are doing things and we need some change. We have tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of requests when we go before God. Isn't that right? We have tons of requests. Now, God's not mad at that, but hear the point. God is trying to say, there is nothing you're dealing with now that has not been dealt with in the past. And if you go to my word, the solutions that I had for my people in the past are solutions that I have for my people right now. So that's why when you go to God and pray, you want to take time to listen and let him talk back to you from his word. Last verse on this, John 17, 20 and 21. I like this. Jesus in John 17 was interceding for his disciples who were present. There was only 11. Judas already took off. But with the 11 disciples that were present, look at what Jesus did. Jesus is praying for them. But when you get to verse 20, he says, neither pray I for these alone. Well, who else is Jesus praying for? But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So that means that those things that Jesus was praying about was not just for disciples present in AD 31, but they were for disciples today in 2023. God is trying to teach us when you have a problem and you want God to speak to you, look to the scriptures because the solutions that God had for his people in the past are solutions that God has for his people right now. You know how many people say, I've talked to God, but he never talks to me. You know why people say that? It's because they don't understand the formula. They want God to do what the movies do. In the movies you hear, you know, you, know, you hear thunder and, and crackling and clouds and you know, things crashing and the earthquakes and, and you hear all that stuff and then you hear, Wayne, hear me. Look unto the mountains. And, and we're, we're waiting for that deep James Earl Jones voice to come out of nowhere and now all of a sudden say something magnificent. We can say, oh, I heard the voice of God. Get your mind out of the movies, family. That's the movies. The way God speaks is through his word because his words are in here. Now, when Jesus said that, he prayed that not just for the disciples that were present with him. He prayed this for the disciples in the last days like you and me. They that, are all, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. This is why unity is something we should fight for in our families, in our churches, to do everything we can. Remember, it's all right to cut just cut as a surgeon, not a butcher. People who try to tell you that we need to have a cutless religion, they don't know what they're talking about. The word of God is a sword, and the word of God is what we use to correct. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correcting. You correct with the scripture, and it's going to cut because the scripture is a sword. It's going to cut. But again, we cut to heal. We don't cut to separate. That's the butcher. It's all right to cut. But as long as the cut is designed for healing and bringing about greater unity, then cut. But be careful that you don't come in like some butcher and you just cutting people and letting stuff off your chest and you just angry and you just want to let out all that anger and you start cutting people and making everybody feel bad and you just let them just separate and walk away even back into the world. That's a butcher's work, not a surgeon. We cut to heal. We don't cut to separate. Jesus says that that should be our focus. Now watch this. When we look at Jesus' study life, 
There are many things to learn. I'm only going to give you two lessons from Jesus' study life. Only two lessons from Jesus' study life. How Jesus let the scriptures speak to him. Okay? Number one, the Bible says he always looked. This was, this was a habit of Jesus when he studied scripture. He always looked for the practical and prophetic lessons in scripture that applied or could apply to himself. That's a good way to study. When Jesus would study, he would look to see what is the word of God saying to me or about me. That's how Jesus would study. Now here's the proof. The Bible says in John 5 and verse 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. Jesus knew that. He said, when I search the scriptures, I know that it's talking about me. When you read the Bible, do you see where God's talking about you? He's talking about you in scripture. Do you see it? Jesus saw it. Not only that, the Bible also says in, in Luke 24, verse 44, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Can you imagine Jesus at 12 years old and he's going to his first Passover and he sees a lamb getting slain and Jesus says, that's me. Can you imagine how solemn that thought was? That at 12 years old, finally, he's allowed. At 12 years old, you're allowed to go to the Passover now. And here it is that he's at the Passover. He sees the lamb get killed to ultimately make atonement for the people. And Jesus knows, wow, that's a picture of my future. How deep that must have been for Jesus to behold that. Well, here it is that, again, Jesus says, the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms. So when Jesus studied the scripture, he's constantly seeing himself. Do you see yourself? Do you see where God is fitting you in the storyline? Do you see the lessons that the Lord is giving you? This is how we study, family. It's how Jesus studied. In fact, in Luke 4, Jesus opens up a scroll from Isaiah and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, etc." When Jesus finishes reading it, Jesus says this in verse 21. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Christ literally saw himself in scripture. He saw when the scriptures was talking about him or applicable to him. This is how we all were supposed to study the Bible. You see, many of us have fear of death, don't we? Many of us. There's some of us who say we're not afraid of death because we're not dying. But all of a sudden, we go to the doctor and we get that shocking news. And the doctor says, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you have this and it's this stage and you more than likely only have a few months to live. And now, now that, that boldness and that courage needs to remain. And for many, it doesn't. For many, it doesn't because we love to live. We're not looking forward to dying. Fear of death is very real. But is there a way that the scripture can speak to us? Well, let me give you an example. There was a time that I had fear of death, terrible fear of death. And uh, I remember that when I was going through this battle of fear of death, a scripture came to my attention. I really thought I was going to die. I mean, I really thought it. But then this scripture came to me. Psalm 118, verses 17 and 18. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he has not given me over unto death. You know what was interesting is the timing that that verse came to me was right at the height of my anxiety of my fear of death. And it came to me through a brother who said, hey, Dwayne, I was having communion with God this morning. I'm aware of what you're going through. And the Lord told me to give you this verse. So then he gave me this verse. Now, seven years later, I know that that verse was literally God's message to me. That verse that was for David a long time ago was now verses that God gave to me. This is how the Lord sometimes speaks to us. He will give you a story in the Bible that normally was referring to someone else, 
but now God will use that same verse and that same principle, and now he will communicate it to you. But this is not true of every case. I have friends who quote these verses, and they kept saying they weren't going to die, and sadly they died. Was God wrong? No, humanity is always wrong. God is never wrong. But the reality is, is sometimes God may not say you're not going to die. But here's something else God will say in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9. For this thing I besought the Lord three times. Some of us have prayed to God several times. But watch this. It says, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness, Dwayne. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, in some cases, the scripture that will apply is, I will not die but live. But in other cases, the scripture may apply, my grace is sufficient for you in this moment of weakness. I will sustain you. That doesn't mean you're not going to die. It just means that God will hold you all the way through the process. So we have to learn how to discern what verse or what verses are the voice of God to me in this experience. But this is how God speaks to us. Now, feeling lonely and like no one cares, a lot of people go through this. Feeling lonely and feeling like no one cares. So you're having devotion. You're praying to God, Lord, I feel so alone. I am so lonely. It seems like no one cares. And sometimes the Lord might have you read one book that points you to a verse, and the verse will say something like this. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So why are you saying that you're lonely? God says, I'm always with you. I will never leave you. So why are you saying that you're lonely? You see, alone is a physical condition. Lonely is a mental, emotional condition. You could be in a room filled with people and still be lonely. You understand that? God says Christians should never, ever deal with that loneliness. Why? Because Jesus is an ever-present Savior. He says, I'm always with you. What do you mean you're lonely? What are you, why are you acting like I'm not there? And you know what happens? Sometimes he's just not real enough to us yet. And that's the journey of us as Christians. God, show me how you can become more real to me. Because Christians in the past learned the lesson. Jesus truly became a friend to them. He can do the same for us. But what about feeling like nobody cares? Casting all your care upon him, why? For he cares for you. There's a beautiful hymn that says, Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares. God wants us to understand, he cares. But what do we need? We need him to speak to us. And that's why you gotta go back to those words when you're going through that emotional turmoil. Now. The summary, we must always remember the Bible was not just written for those in the past. The messages in Scripture are for us today. With proper study methods, we can discern God's voice speaking to us personally from the Scriptures. Last lesson. Another lesson from Jesus' study, study life. This is our last lesson. He trained his mind to submit his deepest feelings to the authority of Scripture. You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ did not want to go through with it. Remember that? He said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. Let it pass. Remember Jesus said that? He didn't want to go through with it. But he, never, he said, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. So as Jesus is going through the final scenes of Gethsemane, here's what the Bible says. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou, I like when Jesus said this part, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? In other words, Jesus is going through all this drama and he knew 
I can be delivered anytime I want. All I got to do is say, Father, send the angels. Because we read in Desire of Ages that the angels were ready. They were ready to deliver Jesus. All he had to do was give the command. So Jesus is aware of his power at that moment. He says, I could call the angels to deliver me. So the question is, Jesus, as much as you wanted to be delivered out of that nasty situation and could have, why is it that you didn't do it? Look at what the Bible says. He says, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Jesus taught you and taught me that even in the most passionate of our feelings, we must submit it to Scripture. No matter how much we feel to do or not do something, we must submit to the Scriptures. Now, that becomes a powerful practical lesson for us because how many of you have ever ran away from the duty God has called you to do? Something that the Lord told you to do. And you know God told you to do it. But what do we do? We run away. We say, no, 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 Lord, that's too heavy. That's too deep. I don't want to do that. What if God told you to give up your career? Some of you are probably making great money. Some of you are probably doing wonderful things. And if God told you, that's what he told me, at the height of my, it's funny. It's, it's real. And, you know, as I look back at my life, God kept calling me at the height of my experiences. I don't know why he kept doing that. It was at the height of my dancing career. I was not a failing dancer. My greatest desire was to choreograph for Michael Jackson. I always said, I want to do choreography for Michael Jackson. That'll seal my choreography career. So I started doing choreography for a lot of big artists and teaching them all these dance moves. So what ended up happening is I got a phone call, but this was after the Lord has already told me to give up the entertainment industry. All the money, I was making a lot of money, okay? More money than I ever made in my life. And here it is, at the height of making money, and then I, my, my agent called me and said, Dwayne, we need you to do this show. And they said, guess who wants you to do choreography for her? And I already told her, look, I'm no longer gonna be in the industry, I'm leaving. And she said, you're crazy. And I said, nope, I made up my mind. And this is what my agent said next. My agent said, Dwayne, I was just about to tell you, you know who wants you to choreograph for you? Choreograph for her? And I was like, who? She said, Janet Jackson. And I was like, oh. and it was a moment of weakness. And it was like God immediately reminded me of the three Hebrew boys. When those brothers were brought before the fiery furnace and Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar said what he said to them, they said, we are not careful in answering you this. They answered very quickly because if the three Hebrews would have said, man, you know that fire gets hot. You ever burnt yourself before? It's going to be seven times more than that. If, if they would have talked like that to each other, we would never have that story in Daniel chapter 3. Never have it. They had to make up their mind quickly. So you know what I did? When she said Janet Jackson, I was like, Oh, man, because I knew if I choreograph for Janet, Michael is a guarantee. The Spirit of God brought it back to my mind, that story of Daniel 3. And you know what I did? I said, look, I cannot go. I'm not doing it. Click, and I hung up the phone and sent them the voicemail from that point forward. It was at the height of my dancing career. And then God calls me away. So, okay, fine. Now I'm a Christian, now I'm a minister and all these things. I meet my wife and we get married and we're poor. We are poor, we are broke, we don't know what in the world we're doing. But nevertheless, we love each other. If somebody comes to me like that about my daughter, it's so not going to happen. You know, if some guy comes to me, I love your daughter and everything else, I'm going to be like, absolutely not. If you don't have a dowry, you have no chance with my daughter. Because I know the word now, I know the word. But I didn't know the word back then, so I just, I just told my wife, I love you, you love me, she proposed, and I'm like, amen, yes. And so we're married. Now, we struggled. We struggled so bad. We struggled in our early years of our marriage. Broke, hurting, and trying, always robbing Peter to pay Paul. Well, here it is. I start working hard. I start learning business principles and business ethics and all this other stuff, financial principles. And next thing you know, I had a guy hire me 
and he hired me and I started, I think I started the job at like 40,000 a year, something like that. And um, I performed very well. He promoted me and then I ended up making 60,000. And then the next year, I ended up making 80,000. Then the year after that, we started making 120. And then the year after that, I started to make 150. Then the year after that, we started to make 200. And the year after that, I started to make 250. So now I'm making $250,000 a year. We have a pretty simple lifestyle. We have cash left over at the end of the month. I told my wife, here's money. Don't come home until you spend it all. I mean, seriously, because I, I was so happy to finally have money. And so I'm doing great. I'm doing Bible studies with everybody at work. Everybody knew Dwayne the preacher. So I'm doing Bible studies at work with all my coworkers and everything. I'm happy and I'm content. I'm making crazy money. I'm doing Bible studies. Life's good. And God has the audacity to tell me, leave the job. I'm calling you into full-time ministry. And I'm thinking to myself, what? Lord, you know how hard I work for this? And God is like, I'm calling you into ministry. Leave it. And I said, what's going to be my income? And God gave me an answer. Matthew chapter 20, verse 4. You know what Matthew 20, verse 4 says? Whatsoever is right. Literally, I started to live off of a salary called whatever's right. Somebody used to say to me, Dwayne, how much money did you make a year? I said, whatever's right. That was my income, whatever's right. But it was right at the height of my success. I don't know why God keeps doing that to me. It's like always at the height of this success that we work hard to get at. And then God says, nope. And then he pulls me someplace else. And that's exactly been my story. And so it is that I know what it is to run away from God. Because the first time God tells me, man, I ran. When the Lord told me to give up my job, I was like, oh, no. I, nope, can't hear you. It, it's like, I, I was literally like, nope, Lord, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Something's going wrong. The signal's messed up. Because I did not want to give up this lifestyle. Bought a beautiful log home in the country. Beautiful eight acres of land. Brand new log cabin. I mean, log cabins are beautiful. We had a brand new log cabin. I, my wife said she wanted a certain car. I was like, absolutely, dear. And get her a car, whatever. I mean, it just felt so good to be able to provide. Dwayne, the children need thus and so. No problem. And now God... And all the ministers that I knew that were self-supporting ministers doing all this work, they were all broke and hurting. So I, I was like, oh no, this is my future. So you better believe I was running. So I know what it is to run away from God. Now obviously I stopped running. And I can truly say as a witness of the Lord for these past 15 plus years of being in full-time self-supporting ministerial work, I can tell you that truly God will take care of you. If it's God's will, it really is God's bill. I have seen the Lord do that, okay? But a lot of us are running away from the duty God has called you to do. We're afraid, we're concerned, we don't know what God is gonna, what's going to happen. What does God's word say to us? We say things like, Lord, I'm hopeless, I'm worthless, I'm despicable, I'm broken, I can't, I can't, I can't. So you know what God does? God says, no problem. And one morning you get up and you read a book like Patriarchs and Prophets and it tells you to go to the book of Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4, the story of Moses. You start reading the story of Moses thinking you're only reading about Moses. But God is like, nope, this is about you. Watch what God says. And Moses said unto the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. What's Moses doing? He's trying to convince God, you must have made a mistake calling me because I have too many weaknesses, too many problems. I'm too deficient. You're reading the story of Moses, but God is like, oh no, you're reading more than that. You are hearing me talk to you right now. And so it is, you continue. And the Lord said unto him, who made your mouth? Who makes the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? And then what does he say? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you will say. It's not that you're just reading about Moses. You're reading about yourself. God is talking to you. 
He's saying, if I called you, don't you talk back to me and try to tell me about how weak, messed up, and incapable you are. God says, I'm the one that's going to make you capable. That's why you got to go when God calls you. When God calls you, beloved, I'm just telling you the truth. You got to go. All you need to do is make sure of one thing, that God called you. If God called you, his will, his bill. Now, some of y'all are saying amen, but if any of your young people say, I'm quitting medical school, because the Lord has told me. You need to make sure that the Lord has spoken. But if the Lord has spoken and your dreams are crushed, you need to let that child go and do what God has called them to do. Amen? Oh, yes, amen. Now, forgiveness is a hard one, isn't it? I mean, you know, people wound you and people hurt you. And here goes God telling you, forgive them. Forgive them. And sometimes we say, Lord, how, how could I forgive him? How could I forgive her for what they've done to me, etc.? And God understands that battle. He really does. But here's, here's God's answer. You see, this was not just to the brethren in the church of Ephesus. This is also God speaking to us. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. How do I do this? Even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. You see, if you wrote a list of what people did to you, if you wrote a list, you might have a long one. But if I challenge you and say, now write a list of what you did to God, I guarantee you, you'll have a longer one. Now, God then asks the question, considering you're more guilty on what you did to me than what your offender did to you, what should I do with you? You know what our response is? Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Isn't that right? Have mercy on me, O Lord. God says, okay, go do thou likewise to the lesser offender. God will give you forgiveness. Ephesians 5, Acts 5 and verse 31, the Bible literally says God gives repentance and he gives forgiveness to us. If you can't forgive, that's your humanity talking. What you need to do is you need to talk to divinity. Go to divinity and say, Lord, help me to forgive this person that appears so hard to forgive. There's a story of a white female police officer and a black civilian. The story says that the white female police officer was trying to just go into her apartment. The problem is, is that she was not going in her apartment. She went into another person's apartment and it was a black civilian. He's just sitting down watching TV. Well, here it is, when she entered the apartment, she's a police officer, so you know what she has. And when she saw the guy, she's thinking, thief. She pulls out the gun, boom, shoots him in his own house, and he drops dead. It made top news in 2019. And when it made top news, oh, how the black community wanted to hang that woman. They, I mean, they, they just wanted to put her under the prison. Now, I believe fully she should get locked up. No question about it. She needs to get locked up and she needs to go into prison and she needs to be punished like an average person. She shouldn't get any favors because she's a police officer because that was next level stupid what she did. That was like really dumb. How do you go into a wrong apartment? How do you go into a wrong apartment? How many times y'all went into the wrong house? I mean, that's just, that's not an average mistake, okay? That was some high level neglect. Well, here it is in the courtroom, the deceased man's brother gets on the podium 
And you know what he says to this woman? Though, I mean, so many people, especially from the black community, they just, they just condemned that woman. They said, you're done. That's it. We hate you. All sorts of stuff. But this man, the deceased man's brother, he said, we forgive you. Then he didn't just say that. But what made top news was this picture right here. Because this picture was right in the courtroom on the day of sentencing. And that's the deceased man's brother hugging the police officer. And here's what he said. He said, I don't know if this is possible. He's talking to the honor, the judge. He says, I don't know if this is possible, but can I give her a hug, please? His name is Brant. Brant Jean asked the judge after telling Geiger, that's the last name of the officer, that his main desire wasn't for her to go to jail, but to give your life to Christ. Wow. Forgiveness. He could have partaken of all that anger and everything that everybody else was feeling, but he didn't even want to go to jail. He just said, I just want you to receive Jesus. Because if you receive Jesus, that's better than going to jail, which to a degree is true. But the reality is, is that, man, this thing created outrage. It says, Brant Jean's act of grace toward his brother's killer sparks a debate over forgiving. On one side, it says, this is, a, this is what one person said, this is the definition of living like Christ would like you to do, Willie Orgy said in reply to a widely watched video on Twitter. He added, vengeance is not ours. What a great gesture by Brant. That was the good response. Here's another response. Why do black folks always have to forgive? CNN analyst Bakari Sellers tweeted after the hug. We can have a conversation about black folk and our unconscionable forgiveness in the face of hate and violence. I don't get it. So you had people on both sides. Some were outraged by what this young man did. Some were encouraged and their faith was built up through what this young man did. But my point to each and every one of us is, is that sometimes you might have people in your life that in your mind you're saying, I could never forgive them for what they did. But the reality is, is if we look at the issues with, through the lens of Calvary, it makes it a lot easier to forgive what appears to be the most unforgivable people. So when you read these stories in the Bible, just remember, it's not just God talking to the people in Ephesus. It's not just God talking to Moses. These will be moments that God will talk right to you and let you know what to do. This is how God speaks. So in summary, God can speak to us through the stories of the Bible and make known our call to duty. He will also give us the assurance that he will be with us and enable us to accomplish what he calls us to do. We may not initially feel to do it, but like Jesus, in the end, it brings joy unspeakable. There are three ways in which the Lord reveals his will to us to guide us and to fit us to guide others. How may we know his voice from that of a stranger? How shall we distinguish it from the voice of a false shepherd? Look at the three ways God speaks. Because remember, communion is us talking to God, but him talking back to us. It says God reveals his will to us in his word, the Holy Scriptures. His voice is also revealed in his providential workings. And it will be recognized if we do not separate our souls from him by walking in our own ways and doing according to our own wills and following the promptings of an unsanctified heart until the senses have become so confused that eternal things are not discerned and the voice of Satan is so disguised that it is accepted as the voice of God. So the two ways God speaks, his word. The second way he speaks, providential workings. Right at the right time, his word comes. Right at the right time. So again, you're battling with unforgiveness right at the right time, Ephesians 4, 31, 32 comes. That's God talking to you. You understand that? Right at the time where we're running away from call to duty, and next thing you know, we're reading Patriarchs and Prophets, but it's telling us to go to Exodus. We go to Exodus, and then we read the story of Moses, and then all of a sudden, we're reading, wow, look at how God responded to Moses 
I think God is talking to me. That's providence and scripture working together. What's the third way that God speaks? Another way in which God's voice is heard is through the appeals of his Holy Spirit making impressions upon the heart, which will be wrought out in the character. If you are in doubt upon any subject, you must first consult the scriptures. So there is a place for impressions. There is a place for saying, I have been impressed that God wants me to do this. But what are the two things that will couple with that impression? You're impressed by the Spirit of God. Providentially, the timing and the circumstances are perfect. And most importantly, it's rooted in the Word. If you have the Word, providence, and the conviction of heart, you better believe God is talking to you. God is talking to you. And that's great news. And so I want to leave you with a devotional plan where you can talk to God and you can hear God talk to you. Here's the devotional plan. If you don't have a devotional plan right now, I'm going to give you this devotional plan. It's a beautiful plan. I've done this. It is a wonderful plan. These five books goes from Genesis to Revelation. This book right here, Patriarchs and Prophets, covers Genesis to 1 Samuel. Prophets and Kings covers 1 Samuel to Malachi. Desire of Ages covers Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts of the Apostles covers the book of Acts to Revelation. And then the Great Controversy covers the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation and also church history. These books takes you through a journey through the Bible. If you have never studied these five books, listen to these words, cover to cover. I've done it at least three times. If you go through these books cover to cover, you're going to be amazed at how God is going to talk to you. So here's a reading program that you could try. You could do whatever you want, but this is just a reading program you can try, okay? Study three chapters of your Bible. You'll need about an hour to do this. If you don't have an hour, just, just chop it up as best as you can. But if you have an hour, you should be able to do this just fine. Study three chapters of the Bible per day and 10 pages from your book. So because Patriarchs and Prophets is your first book right here, you're going to do Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and then you're going to read 10 pages from your book. And then the next day, Genesis 4, 5, and 6, and then you're going to do another 10 pages. And then the next day, Genesis 7, 8, 9, and then you do another 10 pages until you're finished. Once you're finished with that book, you then go to Prophets and Kings and you do the same thing, okay? That's the order of how you read. When you finish reading, I'm going to encourage you, don't take a picture yet because I'm gonna put more on the screen, so you might as well do it when I put it all up. Um, study the three chapters, 10 pages a day. Now watch, after you study, here are the three questions that I want you to ask yourself in your journal. That means hint, hint, you need to be journaling. So. Three questions you're going to ask yourself. Here we go. Question number one. What was the lesson talking about? That's the first question you want to ask at the end of your reading. What was the lesson talking about? This will keep you contextual. It'll make you faithful to what you're reading without adding or taking away. That's the first question. Second question. What does it have to do with me? Ah, that's where you're going to really find out. Okay, Lord, through this lesson, what were you saying to me? Okay? And then the third question. Now you can get your cameras out. Third question, what did I learn about God's character? What did I learn about God's character? This is what you want to add to your study. You ask yourself those three questions. What was the lesson talking about? What does it have to do with me? What am I learning about God's character? If you answer those three questions solidly at the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, at the every study, if you follow this plan, three chapters and ten pages, you will go through Genesis to Revelation in your Bible in one year, and you'll finish all five books in one year. If you do this plan daily, you will finish everything. The Bible, you would read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you'll read all five books cover to cover all in one year. All right? I want you to go ahead and do journaling. 
review God's promises for you. I have a Bible promise book. The devil still attacks me, you know. You better believe Satan still attacks me. I have friends all around me that, that sadly their children are dying and their children are like young teenagers, young adults and stuff. I have four young adults. Do you know I could get a phone call at any moment that somebody could say, hey, I'm really sorry to tell you. Satan, I, I know for a fact Satan hates me. The work that I'm doing, I, I, I understand. Satan is going to attack my marriage. He's going to attack my children. He's going to attack my health. He's going to attack me in any and every way he can to disable me from doing this work right here. And so I have to stay connected to God because God might. You know, Job had a great marriage. But one day Job's wife cursed him and said, just curse God and die. Now, Job might have needed to hear a lot of things from his wife, but he didn't need to hear that. Not from his wife. I always tell my wife, honey, you got to stay prayed up. The devil will try to take advantage of you. I have to stay prayed up. The devil's going to try to take advantage of me. Now, I'm not here to say that we have a bad marriage. Thank the Lord. But I'm saying I am aware of reality. I am aware of the great controversy that we're in. And I know that Satan hates me. I know he hates me. And I know that he wants to put a dent in the work that I do for the Lord. Because I'm ready to die for this message. I'm ready to die for this truth and the God of this truth. And as you heard me preach already, it's evident that I'm not trying to gain the favor of men because once this stuff goes on the internet, especially the night of prophecy fulfilled within, oh, I can guarantee I'm probably going to get uninvited from certain churches that I've already been booked for next year. But you got to tell the people the truth, family. And so the reality is, is that let the chips fall where they may. I just need to stay connected to God. So I have my own personal Bible promise book when the devil tries to get in my head because Satan tries to get in my head. I am not a Superman. I pray to God y'all get that. I might talk up here with boldness and preach the word, but I need Jesus. You hear me? And I need your prayers. I am very much assaulted by Satan. You better believe it. And so I have to fight the good fight of faith. So what do I do? I, I have a Bible promise book, not that I bought, that I wrote myself. I wrote out the promises that speak to me, God's word to me, right? And then I have a journal. Write them down in your daily gratitude journal. You all should have a daily gratitude journal. It's like you're writing your own Bible. It's your experiences. It's not Peter's experience. It's not Isaiah's experience. It's not James' experience, and it's not Jeremiah's experience. It's your experience with God. Journal it. Because if you remember, the children of Israel had a very serious problem with forgetfulness. The children of Israel had a problem. They, they, they get to, I don't even understand how God delivers you from Egypt, and in just a little bit, you're crying over food. Like that, you got Exodus 15, God delivers with a mighty hand, and then by Exodus 16, their belly starts to growl, and they actually said, we wish we were slaves again, just to get some food. Uh, that's crazy to me. But that tells me that's how our human minds work. We can forget very quickly what God has done for us. So what does God do? He says, have a gratitude journal. Your journal is to write down all the great things God has done so that way you don't forget. Benefits of journaling. This is our last slide, I believe. Benefits of journaling. Journaling facilitates heart-to-heart -heart communion with God. That's what you want. You want to write down the times God spoke to you. You don't want to forget that, okay? The devil loves to make us forget. Don't forget that. Journaling fuels spiritual growth. Journaling focuses our attention so the mind won't wander. Journaling forms a permanent record of God's leading. Journaling feeds witnessing and ministry. And lastly, journaling fosters rich communication skills. I'm sorry, number seven. Journaling fortifies faith to cope with crisis. This is why you want to journal, okay? So I want to encourage you as God's people. Family, if you do this, this is going to build strong relationship, okay? This is going to help us because we're preparing to meet our God. And then we're going to help other people prepare to meet their God. 
And in order for us to do that, we got to make sure that we have a strong relationship with the Lord because the devil's going to be busy to make sure that you don't get that connection. He wants you to stay on the surface. He wants you to have a shallow, make-believe walk with the Lord. He doesn't want you to go deep. This is how we go deep. Between yesterday's study and tonight's, this is how we go deep. And the Lord will bless you. Question. How many of us understood our study tonight? Do we understand our study? Is it your desire to say, Lord, by your grace, I want to have a very dynamic walk with you. Not only me learning how to talk to you, but applying the principles we learned tonight to allow you now to talk to us. If you're willing to do that, please stand to your feet with me. I'm going to pray with you. And I know that God is going to bless you. And I look forward to hearing the great breakthroughs that the Lord is going to do for each and every one of us. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for your wonderful words of life. We thank you for the truth as it is in Jesus and that you are helping us and willing to speak to us and not just to hear us. And Lord, I pray, help us to take to heart the lessons that we learned tonight, that we will allow you to speak to us that we might be found faithful at last. Please, Lord, bless us now, I pray, as we leave this place, but never your presence, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, come, oh, come, Till the sun